Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you do can hear me. And um, what I'm going to be speaking about this morning is the archaeology that's been happening at the apothecary for a long time. And yes, it's been under my um, license uh, from the beginning. <clears throat> the Niagara Apothecary in Niagara-on-the-Lake, it has a long history within the community. The establishment of the business began as early as 1820 at another location in town. A total of six pharmacists, which you see listed here, kept the business going until 1964. Five of these uh, pharmacists, if you like, apprenticed with the previous owner, thereby allowing continuity of the business. Henry Pafford is the one who acquired the business in 1865 after James Harvey had passed away and moved it into the um, present building located at 5 Queen Street. And what he enlarged and renovated the building most notably by outfitting the interior with black walnut fixtures imported from Europe, reopening in 1869. The glass and ceramic objects are all original to the apothecary, having been acquired by various pharmacists over the years. The Ontario Heritage Trust acquired the apothecary in 1969 and subsequently undertook restoration of the building in 1970. Since 1971, it's been um, operating as a museum by our partner, the Ontario College of Pharmacy, with upwards of 100,000 visitors annually. We also have a large cultural collection owned by the Trust, as well as our operating partner. And this also includes historic images, which demonstrate how the interior and the exterior of the building has changed over time. This is one of my favorite photographs. It's the train that used to come up King Street, and the apothecary is at the left. Um, of the photo. And these are um, at the Archives of Ontario uh, as well. And the apothecary has uh, some of the photographs. At the archives is a large archival collection, including prescriptions, over 100,000 of those, day books, customer account journals, account ledgers, and drug regulation registers, just to name a few. So in terms of the archaeology, during archaeological investigations in 1988, we encountered a deep feature in one of the trenches we were able to finish um, excavating behind the building. This is the small backyard. The, this feature contained a large quantity of glass containers. <clears throat> Just under 2,000 glass fragments were recovered that year and included a quantity of, an inta of intact pharmaceutical glass containers. While these artifacts were analyzed post-excavation, their importance and relevance to the history of the pharmacy came into play once again with new excavations much later. You will also notice a partial brick footing at the bottom of the image on the left. And at that time, it was interpreted as possibly related to an earlier building on the property dating to the 1840s period. Also in this image at the top is a modern utility trench that was installed in the 1970s. In 2016, I had the opportunity to go back to the rear yard of the apothecary, and yes, I'm very well aware of how many years are in between 1988 and 2016. This allowed us to try to complete the excavation of the feature, or so we assumed. What it did do was recover even more glass artifacts, over 5,700 fragments from the continuation of the same feature. We also re-excavated the footing and followed it to its end. While many of the same types of glass containers were noted, additional containers were recorded in larger quantities than 1988 at a greater depth, and this allowed us to conduct additional research concerning the operation of the apothecary through time, utilizing the 1988 and 2016 assemblages to compare with the archival records. As already noted, prescription and business records exist for the apothecary. These materials provide specific evidence of the apothecary's prescription business and professional operations throughout its existence and provides more general evidence of physicians prescribing practices, general trends in the treatment of illnesses, with prescription drugs and developments in the clinical use of specific pharmaceuticals and chemical substances through time, professional relationships between physicians and pharmacists as well as customers, the activities of specific physicians and pharmacists, 
the cost of drugs and pharmacists dispensing fees, pharmacists business record keeping and promotional activities, trends in the evolution of business forms and record keeping equipment for pharmacies and the use of pharmaceuticals in the treatment of infants. The entries in day books consisted of daily itemized lists of individual customer purchases and included their surname, a brief description of the items purchased, and a notation indicating the price charged for each item. Customer account journals are quite similar and consist of sections headed with surnames of individuals and contain dated, itemized lists of their account purchases with notations indicating the prices charged. The daily business journals recorded not only the drug side of the business, but also a record of sales related to items sold at the soda counter, the food, cosmetics, and all non-drug items, of which there were many. All of this information tells us that the Niagara Apothecary evolved from a profession stressing extemporaneous dispensing of drugs largely of natural origins in the beginning to one emphasizing scientific knowledge about highly potent agents, usually of chemical origin and manufactured in large manufacturing plants by the early 20th century. The medicines they prescribed were all handmade in the beginning, pills, powders, solutions, decoctions, suppositories, tinctures, and elixirs. Through cross-mending of the glass fragments, we had recorded a total of 72 glass vessels in the 1988 assemblage. And then in 2016, we added an additional 128. Some of the notable containers, which some of you can see in this slide, recovered from the two seasons then included the Emerson Drug Company Broma Seltzer bottles from Baltimore, Maryland, and Toronto. Pepto Magnum Goud, a neutral organic compound advertised as a stimulant and tonic. Eye water or vegetable syrup manufactured by the Whitmore Company of Boston and numerous clear glass containers of various sizes with embossed graduations in cc's and in some cases ounces up the sides and in various um, sizes in terms of height of the bottles themselves, reflecting the prescriptive dispensing nature of the apothecary. Other containers noted were Bovril bottle containers, soda pop bottles, cosmetic containers, Florida water bottles, and Rose and Company bottles, which contained lime juice, as well as the uh, Kodak film development fluid uh, that's in the amber brown bottles you see beside the Broma Seltzer bottle. The deposition period for this feature, based on what we know of the manufacturer periods for the containers, represents a clean out of the apothecary and a transition from one pharmacist to another. In this case, it looks like it was when the last pharmacist, Erlen Field, took over the business in 1922. Residue analysis has also been conducted on a number of the intact bottles, and the results have been interesting. Several bottles contain white powder, and this was found to, find, to uh, contain ingredients for antacids. Another glass bottle had red powdered watercolor paint, and another contained cosmetic liquid foundation. The most interesting was a vial that was still packed with pills. They turned out to be homeopathic remedies. However, the active ingredient had dissipated. But that explains what all the vials that you see in the middle of this slide would have contained at one point in time. And then we went back to the apothecary for five weeks in August of 2017. And the focus of these excavations was public archaeology. This was a project that engaged the local community through their local museum, the Niagara on the Lake Historical Society and Museum. We had a total of 24 volunteers while we were there over five weeks. A display case within the apothecary showing the finds from the 2016 field season, sort of like a lure to get people to come around the corner to see what was happening in the backyard. And the visitors to town were able to watch the archeology span as it happens behind a fence. The museum volunteers worked within three groups. One group operated the public engagement table with an interactive display box of artifacts that the public were allowed to handle. An artifact key was made available to these volunteers in order for them to talk about the artifacts with a basic understanding of the objects. A second group consisted of volunteers who wanted to experience hands-on excavation. And the third group was a small number of volunteers who wished to experience processing artifacts which was conducted at the museum. During the five weeks we were there, we had 8,000 visitors. It was busy. 
Now, of course, more containers were recovered from a continuation northwards of this feature. It was not a pit feature as originally assumed back in 1988. It is actually quite linear in nature, essentially trench, a trench. And we did not reach the end of it in 2017. It continued in that north wall of which you see the field director, Elaine Cheng, standing. Now, one ex unexpected discovery was the presence of a burn feature, which you can see in this image. It's um, a light sort of white ash and charcoal stain. Um, there's also a darker uh, root stain, which uh, crosses the feature. And um, on top of this feature was an artifact that was unexpected. This is canister shot, which usually indicates conflict, a battle. So what could have happened here before this corner was known as the apothecary? And this is what became very interesting, looking at early maps, particularly this 1810 map, and conducting additional archival research. Interestingly, the trust had only focused on the 1869 period onwards when they acquired the property. Additional research I had done in the 1990s was undertaken, but only went back to the 1840s, <clears throat> excuse me, when the actual apothecary building was probably uh, built on the property. So the earlier history was still somewhat unknown um, at this time. So I did additional research to discover that the original land grant was to William Dixon, and then the property was subdivided and the south half sold to James and Williams Crooks in July of 1805. James was the first person to export wheat and flour to Montreal and was also a member of the legislature. He and his brothers were merchants. The 1810 map clearly shows a number of buildings on this corner lot, and one is, one is noted as being an inn. Now, a historic map of 1823 shows no buildings on the lot. So what happened? Clearly, there was conflict. And the one that sticks out in everybody's mind is that in December of 1813, during the War of 1812, the American forces had occupied the town, and as they were retreating, they burned the town down. The war loss claim submitted by the Crooks brothers was illuminating. You can see the number of buildings on the lot. Now, the contents were also listed. And there was also an addendum, which mentioned more information about the buildings. So the six bedrooms that you see towards the bottom of the slide is likely the building that was listed as an inn on the 1810 map. But it certainly gave an indication of how busy this corner was at that time period during the War of 1812 um, and the business, uh, in fact, of the uh, Crooks Brothers. Now, one last note about the Crooks Brothers. As merchants, they owned a ship known as the Lord Nelson, which was commandeered by the Americans during the war and renamed. It's now at the bottom of Lake Ontario, for it was renamed by the Americans as the Scourge. And yes, this ship is the Hamilton and Scourge underwater shipwrecks, which are protected under the Act. Now, in 2017, we recovered over 12,000 artifacts, and this indeed indicated that we did have evidence of the earlier occupations based on the ceramics, as well as fire reddened and hardened hand wrought nails, actually a very large quantity of those. We also had deeply buried deposits where it became clear we were excavating at least one of the, not two, cellar deposits. We also had artifacts related to the apothecary business and the buildings we know stood on the property in the mid 1800s. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, the planned project in 2018 was canceled and it wasn't until spring of this year that I was able to return to the apothecary to try and answer a few of the questions that still lingered. Using a mechanical excavator, we removed the backfill from two areas partially excavated in 2017, as well as two new trenches. We then excavated more of the cellar fill from one of these 2017 units and screened all of that fill for covering artifacts. And as you can see from this slide, we recovered a diversity of artifacts, including a fireplace um, and iron that's on the top left going to the right, two intact stoneware bottles pre-1830, which are not on the slide, a, very, a variety of other ceramic ware types, clay tobacco smoking pipes, a barrel hoop, coins, a gun flint, and a partial biface. Finally, 
we reached the bottom of the cellar deposit. And that was <clears throat> seven feet down. And what was of significance was the charred wood remains with hand wrought nails intact in the uh, boards reflecting the burning of the building on the lot during the War of 1812. So this work is currently, um, artifacts are just being finished cataloging and then the analysis of the artifacts will start this winter. To be honest, it's been fascinating to see how this apothecary has evolved and how the business became more specialized into the 20th century serving primarily the broad variety of items sold in the 19th century. To small communities, the apothecary serviced the surrounding area and in response to that community's needs, wants, even demands, changed its store shelves accordingly. What's also been a revelation is the nature of the site having a deeply buried context that normally I wouldn't have expected other than in a more dense urban environment. Taking into account the time depth on this corner, the existence of earlier buildings with cellar deposits and the resulting damage that occurred during a major conflict, it shouldn't be that surprising. Given the size of the backyard, it is, for it's also very likely these deposits extended into adjacent properties, or at least did at one time. At this point, we've recovered close to 30,000 artifacts from this tiny backyard. The majority of the glass containers that were covered over the various field seasons will become part of an online reference collection. It is a unique site, and these artifacts will be a useful resource for archaeologists in the future. Within the next month, the Trust will be launching a searcher collections feature on our website. So look for that. We will have seven archaeological reference collections from historic sites showcasing the diversity of artifacts that were found on these sites over uh, multiple field seasons. And uh, thank you.